It doesn't matter. He tapes over my voice with what he wants anyhow. That's true. <laughs> I, think, I, I identified myself on the first film. Thibodeau over me. Or... The reverse speech part of it really is. Okay, guys. You ready to go? And good day. I'm Ted Gunderson. I have a radio talk show out of the Amerinet Network, Tampa, Florida, 8 to 10 a.m. Pacific time, Monday through Friday. And last summer, the summer of 1997, I invited Chip Tatum to come on my show for a two-hour interview. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that interview ended up 26 hours. And I had him back recently for another interview, another 20-some-hour-plus interview. This man is full of all kinds of information. And before I leave you and introduce you to Chip, let me just mention that uh, my radio show can be heard on Galaxy One Transponder 17 5.58 frequency wideband audio satellite. So today I have with me Chip Tatum. This man is unbelievable. 25 years CIA black ops operator. Chip, welcome to a video which you and I are going to distribute tell the world about what went on behind the scenes in your black op operation. Thanks, Ted. Great to be here. Great to be here. With Great you. to be here. Great huh? to be here. <laughs> Chip never could speak English too well. <laughs> <laughs> now, this guy's very intelligent and a good man, great American. I'm very proud to be a part of uh, his, uh, at least uh, spreading the information out uh, to help uh, Chip any way that I can. And we have some books we're going to talk about later on, the Tatum Chronicles, and uh, Nixon's Darkest Secret, I think, is, yes, Nixon's Darkest Secret, which we will discuss. But before, before we go into the books, Chip, how did you become involved in uh, working for the CIA? And I guess we have to go back to your, uh, your Army training and Special Forces and so forth, right? Sure. I uh, flunked a chemistry exam in, uh, in the early 70s and ended up being drafted, uh, receiving my draft notice. In lieu of going into the Army or another service, I didn't really want to go to Vietnam. So I joined the Air Force. I was promised that I could be an air traffic controller under their project guarantee. Um, uh, they did make me an air traffic controller, but they made me a little bit different type of air traffic controller. They sent me to Army Jump School and Special Forces training, and I became a combat controller. Uh, during my first tour in uh, Vietnam, I was on a classified mission uh, at Having uh, completed the mission, we were captured. Uh, I spent uh, time in captivity, and when I w came out of captivity, captivity, we were debriefed by the uh, CIA station chief out of Saigon, Bill Colby. From that time uh, in 1971 until 1992, uh, I was one of the boys. <laughs> okay, now, now Chip, you joined the Air Force so you could be uh, a traffic controller, right? Air traffic controller. And you were told that you wouldn't have to worry about being in the front lines, right? <laughs> That's right. Even, even if I did go to Vietnam, I would be in an air-conditioned control tower hundreds of miles from the enemy. I and like so uh, what are the jokes do you have for us today? Huh? <laughs> I still like to find that tech sergeant recruiter. <laughs> he probably went underground. <laughs> if he knew any, as much about you as I do, he probably uh, is, uh, disappeared maybe even. Huh? Uh, okay, Chip, so uh, you're, um, you're over, uh, you had like over 100 jumps behind the enemy lines. Right. And this was before you became uh, involved in CIA operations or before? Uh, during. During. So, uh, after your capture, you were grabbed by the CIA, and and uh, and they liked uh, you know what you'd done. Of course, now what uh, was uh, why were you captured, and what were the what led up to that? Um, was this Operation Red Rock? This was Operation Red okay, Rock. Okay, then let's go back before that. Okay. And uh, tell us about uh, Operation Red Rock. When did you first have an inkling uh, that you'd be involved in this operation? Or, uh, excuse me, just a minute. Operation Red Rock is a code word, right? That's, that's a code name for the for the particular mission that we were on. And they always have code names, right? Or numbers. Sometimes they have numbers. Right. Okay. So when did you first have an inkling that uh, you were going to be involved in this operation? Um, I had just jumped in, uh, parachuted in to uh, uh, NKP Thailand, the base that I was uh, TDY to, um, and when I landed on the pad at the medevac uh, pad at uh, the hospital, um, a uh, chopper was inbound, 
and when the chopper landed, uh, a special forces captain and some other people got off. Uh, one of the patients, one of his men was on a stretcher. Uh, the captain went in and the, cur the colonel who ran the base was there to meet me. Uh, they were, it was an award ceremony. Um, when they were going in, uh, he said something to the colonel and they all turned around and looked at me and I knew I was in trouble then. And uh, what happened after that? Uh, the following morning at 3 a.m. I was called into the colonel's office. And let me tell you folks, I was a little airman, you know, just made buck sergeant and I rarely had contact with a colonel in my life. One time and that, that's for disciplinary purposes in Oklahoma City. <laughs> <laughs> and how old were you then? 19 years old. Just a kid. Just a, just a kid. So when they told me I was to report to the colonel, I knew I was dead. I'd done something wrong. Well, not wrong. yet. <laughs> I'd done something wrong, and I was gonna, gonna fix and to get it. Uh, but, but Chip, had you had special forces training at that point? Yeah, uh, I had spent uh, almost a year in special forces training across the United States, uh, Sea Survival School, uh, POW, jungle training, the works. And uh, what did the colonel say to you when you walked into his office? He told me that I was uh, there to uh, join a mission, a team, a joint task force that's been put together uh, for a classified mission. And uh, I, he gave me the opportunity to, to talk and let him know how I felt about it. And he said, how do you feel about this, Sergeant Tatum? I said, well, you know, sir, uh, I'm new in country. I, I really don't, other than schooling, don't have the experience of someone you need for this. Uh, I think you ought to get someone else. He said, I didn't ask you what you think. I just gave you the opportunity to accept it before I told you you're going anyhow. Okay, so you volunteered, in other words. He volunteered me. <laughs> yeah, right, okay. <laughs> and what happened next? Did you go into training with these people then, with, with the other uh, went, went, crew, crew members? Went and packed up my gear, uh, was on the chopper out of there within an hour. And uh, where, where did you uh, fly to, and when did you arrive there? We flew about uh, 20 kilometers outside of NKP to a, outside of a small village where we'd set up a training camp for Team Red Rock. Uh, the person that I was replacing was their commo man. He had, uh, on, a, on a jump, had broken his leg. Uh, and I, I was jump qualified. I was special forces qualified. So I was his replacement. And this was in Vietnam at the time? Cambodia, or it was Thailand. In Thailand, OK. And uh, tell us about your training. Uh, it, it was a short two-week training, uh, really familiarity with one another because we actually didn't get the uh, mission parameters in until three days prior to the, uh, to the operation. Um, we were primarily set in, set in place and uh, worked in the, in the community seeking out uh, Viet Cong along the border uh, of Laos so, so that we could get some uh, tactical training. Uh, we also were working and trying to develop tandem jump techniques because our part of the mission and we didn't understand why we had to learn tandem jumping. Uh, that's parachuting with two people uh, un until the actual mission brief. But uh, we were trying to work out tandem jump techniques and we did it. And how many people were in training with you at that point? All 13, just, just the 13 team members. Uh, then we brought in, uh, for each team member, there was a North Vietnamese sapper. Uh, that was brought in uh, to train with us. They were our, our prisoners, uh, Amer uh, prisoner of wars that we had captured in battle. And uh, these were the ones that were going to jump with you? These were the ones that uh, we weren't sure why we, we were jumping with them and, and working with them. All we knew is that uh, these were the men that we were going to be doing something with at that point. Did you know any of these other crew members uh, before this? No, like I say, I was the only Air Force member of the Air Force, and I'd just been in the Air Force for a year, so no, no one. And did they know each other? No. And normally that's done for compartmentalization, especially when you're talking about a highly classified mission. The worst thing you can have is a group of good old boys, uh, and there's a reason for that, you know. Uh, in special operations, you, you can't have uh, the influence of a friendship. It, it can clutter your mind and keep you from doing the mechanical uh, operation that you were trained to do. Uh, because conceivably you could be asked to uh, kill one of your fellow associates or fellow soldiers too, right? They, they may Under come certain to you, circumstances. They may come to you and tell you that uh, he, he, he's uh, a spy in the group and he needs to be taken out. And if you're his friend, you're going to be probably uh, more apt not to do it than if you just didn't know him. And uh, did you know the last names of these individuals? No. We all had code names. Uh, mine, although they called me Bulldog in country, uh, 
the actual code name I was given while I was there was Highway. Why? Any particular reason for Highway? Our captain, uh, team commander, uh, would always explain to us, it's my way or the highway, and he'd tell the team that. Well, I was willing to take the highway. I wanted to leave, <laughs> especially after I saw the kind of things they did. Those guys were crazy. <laughs> for example? So I, I took the highway. Highway. Well, at one point, they, uh, they were seeing uh, how high the helicopter could go and jump without a parachute without getting hurt, you know. Just for fun. I, I mean, mean this, how, was, this was an in-country activity, and they had a contest every year where they would take, and they just jump out of the helicopter as, as it was exiting the AO. Well, there were a few guys broke their legs on that one, weren't there? <laughs> you bet. That's how ready the, the guy I replaced broke his leg. How high would they go, by the way? Well, I went high, and I, I was dizzy for about two hours. <laughs> how high I, were you when you jumped? I think it was about 35. Oh, that's, you I had did. to know how to roll then, didn't you? Oh, roll. I didn't even know I was... I thought I was stepping out of the aircraft onto the ground, but he'd taken off already. I thought he was just hover, hovering, you know. So much for surprises, huh? Sure. Okay, so you saw these crazy guys training, and you said, hey, you know, I wish I'd uh, taken that assignment back 100 miles behind the enemy lines in the, uh, air at, the <laughs> at the airport as air traffic controller. It didn't work out too well. Uh, so what happened after that, Chip? <laughs> The, uh, we were called back in to Task Force Alpha. That was the intelligence entity. Uh, they, that's where all of the intelligence was gathered for uh, South, the South Vietnam uh, uh, area of operations um, and integrated and then passed out. So anything that comes out of Task Force Al Alpha has to be the correct information. Uh, everyone accepts that as being authentic and on, on target for, for our intelligence. We were called back to Task Force Alpha uh, we met for our actual mission briefing. Um, when we went, went to sit, uh, the colonel called the room to attention and in walked a general and a couple civilians. Uh, we had already been told that there are a lot of suits around and that's, that just means CIA uh, in the area. Uh, a lot of activity, suit activity, so we knew something was up. Uh, the man who actually briefed us, we nicknamed Mr. Peepers because he looked like the Mr. Peepers from, from the screen. Uh, Bill Colby. Uh, he was Bill Colby. Uh, and yeah, he was uh, station chief there for the CIA in uh, South, yeah, and, Southeast Asia. And actually, the, the CIA does not operate in a, in a uh, arena, was not allowed to operate in that arena as, as the CIA. So his actual designation was Ambassador Colby, attached through the embassy in Saigon. Uh, you know, political officers are political officers, and that's how they get away with that. Yeah. So uh, this was the night before you jumped? Um, on your mission? It ended up being uh, three days before we jumped because we had some weather delays on the mission. Um, they, the other man that was with him, the uh, general from Washington, was General Haig. Who oh, Alexander Haig. That's correct. Uh, I know him well. Uh -huh. uh, as a matter of fact, I interviewed him in the White House on occasion when I was with the FBI. Uh -huh. That's another story. I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you that one someday. Folks, <laughs> I never have revealed that uh, to anybody about my interview with General Haig. And then I saw him years later at a banquet, State Department banquet, and I walked up to him. By the way, I, I read him his rights when I went in the White House. Uh -huh. I said, you have a right to remain silent, you have a right to an attorney. And um, I met him at a banquet years later at the State Department, and um, I walked up. He gave the speech. It was, uh, you know, a social affair. And I introduced myself. Oh, he says, I remember you. He says, are you going to read me my rights today? <laughs> He's <laughs> pretty bulletproof. Yeah. He, he is. <laughs> Go ahead with Alexander Haig. So Alexander Haig and Mr. Peepers is, are there, Bill Colby, mm -hmm. who uh, later became director of the CIA. Right. And uh, what, were, what did they tell you? Uh, they explained to us that the, the reason General Haig was there is that the, he was the assistant to our national security advisor, uh, Henry Kissinger. Uh, Kissinger worked directly for the president, and the president had decided that uh, it was in the best interest of the country and of the war to see to the end of the war as quickly po as possible, and Operation Red Rock was one of those key elements to that. They needed to get uh, the foreign nations, Laos, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, more involved on the, in the offensive level rather than in a defensive posture uh, in the war so that we could start extracting troops out and, and leave the arena. Um, what we needed to do was go in, jump into what they had planned for us to do was jump into one of our allies' countries, uh, dressed as North Vietnamese sappers. That's why we were working with these other sappers. Uh, a sapper sapper. is what a prisoner of war? No, a sapper is a, a, a North or is a uh, Vietnamese communist soldier. Okay. Uh, 
that. Right. Tunnel diggers, you know, you, we've all heard about okay. the tunnels over right. there. Uh, gorillas, I mean, okay. a, a true, true gorilla. Very, very well trained. Um, so these, these sappers are, are who we were actually going in with uh, to Phnom Penh Airport in Cambodia. The reason uh, it was decided to do this was Lon Nol, the CIA placed uh, premier of Cambodia at the time was still fence setting. He just wouldn't get in a heavy offensive posture against uh, the Chinese led uh, armies of North Vietnam. Uh, he was sitting on the fence, so we decided if we went in as uh, North Vietnamese sappers and totally destroyed the assets on the airport, uh, which were primarily supplied by the United States anyhow, uh, they were our aircraft that we'd given him. There were some French aircraft on, on the tarmac, but not many. Uh, if we would totally destroy those assets, it would make him realize that uh, the North Vietnamese communists were actually coming in after his country now. And he'd get off the fence and ask us for help. Boy, it worked, too. Well, you said uh, we decided, uh, you mean uh, people in Washington, D.C. decided? Nixon. Nixon, Nixon, Nixon himself. This was actually Dr. Kissinger's plan. So Dr. Kissinger came up with this idea. Came up Nixon with approved it. He approved it with the statement after, after uh, thorough thought that, uh, and this was debriefed to me by uh, Mr. Colby, that no one can ever know. No one can ever know what we've done to our allies. Otherwise, we wouldn't be trusted anywhere in the world. And was that the case? That was the case. No one could ever know what we had done. And I was, it, we, when we were debriefed, we were debriefed with a 25 year classification period. That we well, you were debriefed about years, what, years later? Uh, I was debriefed uh, when I came out of the coma in, ho in the hospital in 1971. Okay. Uh, now this is uh, what year now again, going back to the... 1971. When you, when you made the drop and you were debriefed? Uh, in Janu that's... January of 71, and then I was debriefed in uh, June of 71. Okay. Okay, so uh, you, you made the drop with the sappers, right? Made, made the drop. It was a night jump uh, out, of, out of a, C a C-130, night drop in. Uh, just south of town, we made our way into Phnom Penh. Uh, we rendezvoused with our transportation. Our transportation was uh, provided by Monton Yards. That's mountain men? Mountain men from Vietnam, special forces trained. Uh, very good fighters, but the thing about Monton Yards is if they saw that the, the platoon that they were working with, and spe the special forces platoons, or the recon groups they were working with, if they saw that they were going to lose, all of a sudden those guys disappeared into the forest. They weren't going to lose with them. Right. <laughs> and they could negotiate those jungles like it was nothing. Now, you were uh, 13 men. Did you have 13 sappers? Uh, no. Unfortunately, we lost one sapper, uh, and Snake uh, just didn't get along with them. Neither did Pablo. But uh, Snake is co words for two of the guys in your crew. Snake and Pablo, yeah. They didn't get along with them. So we didn't go in with a full contingency of sappers. Uh, when we did jump in, the sappers had figured out that they weren't going in. We had told them, our interpreter told them, that uh, we were actually jumping in to turn them over and trade them for American prisoners, and they were in a release program. Well, they didn't believe that. So they had their own plan, contingency plan set up, and when we, were, uh, went in, when, when we jumped in, they simply, because they were hanging below us and in front of us for the jump, uh, they, they simply tucked caused us to and caused us to fall and roll and uh, tried to take us out. When we were and down. how many sappers were there? Twelve then? Uh-huh. Twelve and thirteen. Uh-huh. And, and when it was all said and done, there was eight. Eight sappers? Eight sappers were left there. Uh, so uh, a few, you A few of them uh, tried to escape and die as we uh, traversed trying to get uh, to our target. So five of them... In total. No, no. Uh, eight, you had uh, four of them then. Yeah, four of them with us. Four of them died. Four of them died uh, after, right after you jumped. Right. Uh, because they tried to overtake you. Now, what did you do with the others that were there that, that uh, we, did survive? Well, we had to leave some evidence of who, who was uh, providing the, uh, the operation. We had to leave, it, leave them on the airport. So we released them on the airport uh, and let, gave, gave them a fair chance to go and then shot them. And uh, in the meantime, did you uh, commit your act to sabotage at the airport uh, after that or before that? We had several different imp it, entry points uh, into the airport. Uh, we came in the north side by the munitions dump. Uh, and, uh, you know, when we talk about coming in the north side, we didn't realize that there were mines in this uh, called a dead zone. Uh, it, and it was completely mined between the two fences. And we weren't briefed on that. So we, we immediately knew something was up. Uh, and we weren't 
we know now that we weren't to return and we were to be left there. Well, if you came in and you went through the minefield, you survived going in, right? I, I didn't go through that, the minefield. I came in the front door of the airport with the team. Okay. The ones that came in through the minefield, did they survive? Yes. The, the sapper didn't. Oh, I see. They, they sent they, a zapper out ahead of them? The, the, sap, the sapper, when they found, figured out they were in a minefield, they let him go ahead to clear the mines. Okay. So uh, you committed your act of sabotage. Yes. And uh, what about uh, ground forces uh, at the airport, the other side? Well, it, it was a staged arena. The ground forces had been pulled away. Uh, there, there was minim, minimum security, just a skeleton crew there. We uh, ran across the skeleton crew of uh, palace guards that had been there, um, confronted them, and had to take them out. And uh, so uh, was your, uh, were your act of sabotage uh, quite uh, uh, all-inclusive, or... Was it just kind of a hit and miss situation, just to let you, let them know that uh, so-called the North Vietnamese have been in there? No, it, it was fairly inclusive. We even had air support from pilots, uh, um, whether uh, uh, flying uh, North Vietnamese aircraft. Uh, they dropped some uh, rounds on on the airport so that uh, we could ensure that the, the devastation was good enough to warrant Lon Knoll's participation with us. And uh, you've completed your mission. The sappers were uh, eliminated. Uh, you left. How many survived coming out of there? There were 13. Every, every one of us. Every one of you survived. Every one of us walked out, walked out of that encampment. Weren't alive. they worried about one of you going and uh, being identified as an Anglo uh, at the airport, even though you're dressed in North Vietnamese well, uniform? And uh, there was a contingency for that. Uh, we had what called, what's called slap packs. Uh, it's, uh, it's a uh, napalm-filled... Uh, container that uh, we could pour the napalm on the body and pop a, a magnesium grenade, whiskey peat, and uh, burn their body right there. So, so know, the, the not there. recognizable then. Sure. Yeah. Okay, you got out, and what happened after that? How'd you get out of there? Uh, the Montagnards who were tasked with the transportation. Uh, we had a rendezvous point. Uh, we met, uh, we exited the area of operation and uh, started heading north out of town. We knew it was uh, 15 to 25 miles to the northeast of town was our rendezvous point where we were to be picked up. Uh, but that, you know, it's not like the interstates we have here. These are little, little roads. Uh, we, we had a first indication that something was wrong because uh, our platoon sergeant, Pop, saw that we were going in the, a little bit of the wrong direction and we never really turned to the northeast. And then the timing was off. All of a sudden they stopped and it, it wasn't long enough to have gone 15 clicks or 20 clicks outside of town. So 50 kilometers, you went maybe, for what, 5, 10? Maybe about 10, after we left the limits of town. Right, uh, right. About, about so you stopped, hours. and what happened then? Well, the, the, we were in a, a large vegetable truck um, with canvas sides. Uh, it, came, it came, it stopped, and the Montagnards Yards uh, got out. But we all, all of a sudden, we heard receivers click. Uh, they, were, they were loading their weapons. Uh, so Pop and, uh, and my way, our, our team commander, uh, moved around to the back of the truck. They each, each took out a grenade on each side and tossed the grenade up back toward the, the front of the truck on the, on the ground. They didn't pull the pins, they just took the grenades out. That, when, when you're a person and you see a grenade fall, you jump, you dive, you try to get out of there. And that's what the Montagnards did. Uh, when, when, after they'd thrown the grenades out, they immediately jumped out and took, took over uh, overcame, took control. Took control. Over, overcame the guards. Uh, the interrogation started, and it, it didn't last long. They asked the first one the question. Uh, when he wouldn't answer, they shot him. They asked the second one the question, and he answered anything we wanted uh, to know. And then you shot him afterwards? Um, no. no. Uh, you didn't? Okay. So I won't go into that. <laughs> uh, okay. Now, did you find any... any situation there? Any, any contingency situation in looking around? I mean, well, as, as we why around, did they stop at that particular as, as location? As we looked around, we went out into the field and we found that there was a large hole that had been put in the ground and that was going to be where they were. He told us, it, we didn't have to look around, he told us that uh, their job was they were briefed that they were to kill us uh, and they were to drop us in a hole and they showed us, you know, this one showed us where the hole was. Uh, we actually used that as a command post area to call in the other air, call in aircraft for support. Move the pickup zone from where it was to this new pickup zone. Um, we spent some time through through the and in through the day and into the evening waiting to be picked up. 
uh, it, it was quite uh, comprehensive what we had to go through just to communicate out of the country and get an aircraft to come into a place that we weren't. You know, I we contacted uh, Moonbeam, which was our airborne command post in the area of operations on HF frequencies, high, high frequencies, um, and tried to get them to come in and you know the pilot said well you can't be there because we aren't there you know in Cambodia and that has only recently I guess in the past what 10 years or so come out that yeah we really were in there we really were operating in Cambodia we re really were operating in Laos uh, and these were classified arenas so this did you have an alternative plan in case something went wrong that you would be picked up at a certain location there then uh, the the plan that we had my way had uh, thought early on, you know, things just, he'd been through a lot of these missions as a team commander. He and Pop had decided, well, things really don't seem as they are here. There's something wrong. And I guess any time anytime they knew that any time you were working with suits, you better cover, cover your tail because they're not going to look out for your best interest. You have to look out for your own best interest. So they did leave contingency plans back at the base with trusted persons uh, to try and pick us up, one of them being a friend of mine who was a chopper pilot, uh, another being uh, a command, command post uh, non-commissioned officer in charge of the command post. So, you know, contingency plans were there. However, you had to get messages to them to, to get those contingency plans in place, and that's what we were trying to do. Now, did you uh, expect the airplanes to come in and pick you up at that point? Yeah, after we talked to them, we finally got clearance for them to come in. We, there, one aircraft even came in and circled uh, the LZ ahead of time, making sure the area was clear for the chopper to come in. Uh, then the chopper came in, but uh, from what I was briefed by uh, Mr. Colby, as the chopper was coming in, the colonel who was involved with uh, the operation from Task Force Alpha uh, had caught on that we, we had a contingency and we were being extra extracted out of the area. Uh, he didn't want it to happen. He was promised a star if we didn't come back. Now, you're telling me you had your own contingency without the colonel knowing about it, and he found out about it. You bet. He found out you about You are it. clever, aren't you? Not me. My way and pop, Ted. My way and my pop. My way and pop. They're, they were wonderful They're, teachers. They, 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 were, they could see ahead. And pop has severe brain damage today from, from that. You still alive? Still alive, yes. And uh, so, so, Chip, uh, you have this one location you were supposed to be picked up. Were you smart enough not to go and wait there? <laughs> you... The original location or the, the the original? No, we never went there. Okay, <laughs> there's no. You went way. to the new one. After, after, after that aircraft came in, after, when the chopper was inbound to us, we had decided that, uh, well, here here comes our aircraft. But they were contacted over radio. Uh, it was a rescue aircraft, a King aircraft coming in. They were contacted that there were actually sappers had taken over Team Red Rocket. Remember, we were dressed as sappers. We didn't have any U.S. uniforms. If we had been caught in country, we'd been prosecuted as spies because that's against all international law. So here we were, dressed in sappers in a foreign country, talking to these aircraft. I was, I was controlling them down um, as, as a combat controller. That's my job, bringing them into the LZ because it was a very small area. Uh, bringing them in, uh, knowing that we we're going to leave. I mean, my heart was pumping. The adrenaline was flowing, I was tired, I was hungry, but man, we're getting out of here. And uh, all of a sudden, the door guns on the, on the jolly let loose. Uh, I was debrief when, we were, when I was debriefed by Bill Colby, he said the colonel had called them and said that uh, Team Red Rock had been overcome. It's actually sappers and protect yourselves. And they saw sappers. Remember, this is the man who runs the intelligence entity for Southeast Asia telling him this. So they fired. And how many did you lose there? Two. And uh, how did, how did, what, I mean, they didn't come in and clean, so you're down to 11 now. Down to 11. Uh, they, they actually had called in. We lost two men, and, uh, but we had to return fire on the aircraft, shooting, shooting out uh, the rear of the aircraft rather than shooting at the pilots because we didn't want to hurt our own guys, you know. We, did, the, did the plane go down? No, no. It, it, we shot, look, from the smoke and everything, it looked like maybe some hydraulics were shot out on it or something. We, we weren't sure. At any rate, they uh, they left the area, but they called in some air support to drop, to drop on that uh, LZ bombs, drop uh, napalms on it. Uh huh. So we got out, we got out of the area quick, and as we were exiting, uh, the sky lit up in the LZ. But uh, uh, until you got out, you'd lost two men. Then you had to lost leave them behind. Men, had to leave them behind using the slap packs so that they'd never be identified. Right. Okay. So there's eleven out. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you decide to do then? Well, we decided we were we would be best to try to make it across country ourselves. 
trust no one. <laughs> and that's that's the way these guys operated. You know, we had some some of the best of the best on that team. I was just a kid. I was a victim of circumstances in there. And I mean, I had never engaged the enemy before I had gotten on Team Red Rock. Uh, but I engaged the enemy almost hourly after I was with Team Red Rock. Uh, we traversed across the country going toward uh, toward uh, South Vietnam, toward the Cambodia-Vietnamese border. You're still in Cambodia. Still in Cambodia trying to make it to the border. And you have to understand, Cambodia was a refuge for the North Vietnamese. They could come into South Vietnam, they could attack, and then they could pull back across that border. Uh, and we weren't allowed to come across that border into Cambodia to attack them, to take, take them out. So they could resupply, they could rest, recuperate, R&R, &R, whatever, and then come back in. It was a very difficult position. And that's why Nixon wanted to uh, deneutralize them, right? Sure. So you could go after them in Cambodia. Well, and maybe and the, so Cambodian the Cambodian countries, were, yeah, sure. could go after them too, right? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so you, how many kilometers or how many miles did you have to go to get to the border? Um, well, we didn't have maps. We had no idea. We, we know that, well, it was from, Cam from Phnom Penh all the way to the border. That's 200, I guess, 200 miles. Uh, so uh, it, it took, we were out uh, for weeks. Uh, trying to uh, work our way through the jungles. We'd uh, come across some, uh, some teams, uh, patrols, routine patrols, and we'd either evade them or we'd engage them, one right. or two. No, how about eating? How about food? Um, yeah, uh, food was pretty easy to get, you know, as a survival. We'd come across villages, too, and we'd get food from the villages. But, uh, you must have shocked the heck out of the villagers then, huh? Well, no, we were still dressed as oh, still. Oh, I yeah. see, yeah. But, I mean, you know, you're a man, right? Well, you know, we were we did were you thin. Have slanted eyes? We we were thin, and and we did have uh, team members who, the one called the kid was uh, CIA, and he was he was Vietnamese, so you know it wasn't that we didn't go into the villages ourselves. We'd stay back in the in the shadows, of the of the forest area, and the kid would go in and talk to him and get the food, and so you know it wasn't. Did, did he did he survive the kid? No, the kid did not survive. Okay, but uh, okay, so you made your way across some maybe two hundred miles. And how close to, were to you? within four miles of the border. Oh, you're kidding. Uh, and then we saw some uh, F-4s uh, circling the area. It looked like they were trying to get into an area, but there was a AAA artillery site, uh, uh, anti-aircraft artillery, firing on the F-4s. And, you know, we, had, we still had some, uh, some munitions left uh, that we could take them out with, uh, some C-4 packs. So we decided, hey, you know, we'll, we'll just take this out. And that was probably our greatest mistake. We didn't realize that we were in, in, in the middle of almost a battalion size uh, contingency of North Vietnamese. Battalion size being how many troops? Uh, I have no idea. I, I know that uh, as, as we counted troops and as, as we passed encampments, easily over 2,000. And here's uh, 11 men trying to survive four miles from the border, and you decided to take this anti aircraft. Blew it to hell and back, too. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you did, <laughs> but that was a mistake because that, that brought a lot mistake. of uh, undue, un un unnecessary pressure on you, and uh, obviously they started looking around for, hey, where'd this come from, right? Yeah, and as we'd walk across paddies, the patrols would be coming one way, and, you know, we dressed as sappers, you know, using, and had, didn't have U.S. Uh, uh, munitions with us. All of our munitions were, uh, were Chinese uh, AKs and so forth, so we, we would be traversing one side of the paddy while this other team would come across and kid would be there and salute them, you know, and hail them, and we'd just keep walking, you know, but however, one time we came right up to the forest area and we came face to face, and here's this, here's this kind of face looking directly into a, uh, a North Vietnamese uh, lieutenant, and we were in trouble. Obviously, yeah. obviously. Did you have? Did you, did you go into combat then, or did you try went, to? Went right into combat. Then. <laughs> Oops. Let me see. Where's that AK? Whatever. Huh? No, they didn't have enough bullets in those for me. <laughs> uh, they, uh, my way used to tell me, you know, uh, I was a white knuckle fire because I'd hold that trigger down and melt that barrel. <laughs> the clips just weren't big enough for me. <laughs> so you had hand to hand, hand at that point. I had hand to hand. I'd melted barrels. We'd, we we. We actually ran out of ammunition. We had to overtake uh, other patrols to re-stock re, uh, ourselves. I mean, these guys were good. They were the best, Ted. They were true American heroes doing, doing their job as best they could. Don't you think there's some day, Chip, that we can uh, honor these men, but there's no way of knowing their last names, is there? Well, you know, Pop, it, Pop knows a couple of them, and uh, I think that uh, someday he may be willing to do that. He does have... Uh, uh, severe neurological problems. Uh, he's able to talk. He knows me. Uh, he remembers what went on, but uh, it, it's affected his motor 
uh, motor movements, and, and he uh, he's not willing to, to do anything he thinks that will uh, endanger his family. Can't blame him for that. Not at all, no. And he's still alive, and where is he? What state is he Oklahoma. in? Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Good old Oki, huh? Mm -hmm. So what happens? You were captured? We were captured. Uh, we spent 92 days in captivity being moved from point to point uh, in camps. Uh, we were uh, actually uh, interrogated by Chinese and Soviet officers. It was never Vietnamese officers. The, the Vietnamese were there, uh, Vietnamese soldiers in the encampments, because it was theirs. But the actual linguists and interrogate, interrogators and those who performed the torture were uh, Chinese and Soviet. How many, how many do you have there now in your team? I believe uh, 10, maybe 9 ended up in, in captivity. So you lost two along the way, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, where did they uh, incarcerate you? Uh, they started moving us in, in the jungles along the border area, not knowing that we were only four kilometers from the border. We just know we were being moved. Uh, we were incarcerated in one small encampment, then we were moved to a larger uh, encampment. Uh, and this had been used uh, in the past, you could tell, because they had cages set up in a semicircular area, and they had three posts set up and they they took two of us immediately they stripped us of our clothing broke my broke this foot my right foot so that uh, we couldn't try to escape uh, you know, they, they break everybody's foot broke everyone's well they didn't break one of the guys was already unconscious and they didn't break his foot but uh, uh, they broke all of our foot all of our feet one foot anyhow um, stripped us of our clothing and put us in these cages uh, two of our two of our guys they put on the posts uh, and we thought that they would be tortured right away, but they weren't. They put them on those posts so that uh, we could watch them as they suffered up there. They weren't given food. They weren't given water. The rest of us were given, given uh, some water and some food uh, on occasion. And when you say put them on the post, they tied them to a post out there where you could see them right. from your cages. Mm -hmm. And uh, did the, uh, who interrogated you? say a Russian and a Chinese... So the Soviet, the Soviet officer seemed to be in charge of this particular camp, and the uh, Chinese officer uh, was that was his cohort was actually the man who administered the torture. Once that started, do you want to go into the torture at all, or I would really you prefer not to? Know. Yeah, I, I thought so. Uh, how about uh, how many men were tortured? Were you all tortured? We were all tortured, and uh, when it was all said and done, there were three of us alive. When when we were finally uh, uh, released. I shouldn't even say released. Uh, we well, you, were, a, you were rescued, actually. We were rescued by a, a Marine Recon Patrol, and boy, I'll tell you, I love those guys. I guess you do. All you Marine Recons out there, aces <laughs> up, buddies. Uh, that's the only reason I'm alive today. Uh, well, so there are three of us survived. So, uh, so uh, 13 came out of the Cambodian airport. Uh, you lost two uh, from um, air... Friendly, friendly skies, mm -hmm. friendly fire, and then across the jungle, you lost two more, mm -hmm. uh, and now you're down to what, eight? Had, had eight, uh, and we, we ended up losing the uh, Montagnard that was with us, that we'd pulled with us. <laughs> he, he was ready to uh, start squealing and tell who we were, so we decided loose lips sink ships from the old briefing days, so they just took him out. We took him out ourselves. Okay, before this is that. before you were captured then? Uh, no, after we were captured. Oh, did you? Okay, okay. We were bringing him back uh, to put in front of that colonel before these guys did to that colonel what they intended to do to him. Okay. Uh, so, uh, can I mention the one, the, the colonel that you had had a, a medal on him, a religious medal on his our captain. Uh, a captain had a religious medal on his, uh, around his neck. Had a St. Saint Christopher medal. I think that's right. the, the, I'm not sure, the medal of Catholic, travel or something like yes. that. Yes. And they, uh, just, if I can mention this, just one thing. One of the tortures that they did was uh, skin him alive, right? Skinned him alive, right. In front of the rest of you. Put, put him in a, in a configuration like a cross as a Christian uh, and skinned him alive in front of us. Uh, held uh, knives and bayonets to our temples required us to watch watch it. If we closed our eyes or tried to turn our heads, they'd start pushing in. And uh, God have mercy on his soul. Um, tragic. Uh, then, um, so you're, you're rescued, mm -hmm. and there was a fight there at the camp between the Marines. The fight. The Marines didn't know we were in the encampment. They, they came in, they were mapping the area for a Lamson 719 was the mission number. Uh, they were just simply in there mapping it, mapping the area, and they were told if they came across any 
prisoner of wars, do what you need to to extract them. Um, so they they were actually found out by the uh, by the guards, uh, and a firefight ensued. Uh, our guys won, and uh, three of us were left alive after that. However, uh, one of them, one of our guys uh, from a Chinese officer, had a stomach wound. Uh, that was uh, pretty unfortunate. He was a good Kansas kid, you know. Uh, he had a stomach wound, and he, I was told uh, when we were debriefed that he later died from that wound. Uh, I was, uh, we had gotten out of the cages uh, and started running for the jungle, uh, and I recall seeing one of the young uh, Marines go down on a knee, level down on me, and I was running. Uh, my weight was on my right leg, and he shot a ricochet. I, it wasn't a full-force bullet. A ricochet hit me in, in the leg, bent my leg backwards. I tumbled, and uh, I'm also told that a grenade went off, and it, Hit, hit me in the back of the head across here, pretty good scar back there right now, that uh, rendered me unconscious and caused a lot of swelling on the brain. Uh, so I was aerovac'd uh, from, from Saigon, I was aerovac'd into uh, Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. Well, did the Marines, uh, if he was firing at you, he didn't realize they you didn't were an American? He didn't realize we were yeah. American. They didn't know we were there. And uh, at what point did, were the Marines aware that they had some POWs on their hands? Uh, our, our team member that was shot in the stomach started yelling in English to them, and so they realized uh, that there were some in there. Good, okay. So he saved our lives. Uh, and so you came out, mm -hmm. and you went over to Clark Air Force Base after that? Right. And that when I finally came to uh, uh, later, uh, within three days, uh, that man from Saigon, Bill Colby, was there to debrief me. And at that point, he told me that I have two choices. I can work directly for the CIA or I can stay with the military, uh, which, uh, which I've had such great experiences with <laughs> at that point, <laughs> and work under the operational control of the CIA. Well, you know, honestly, I figured, hey, you know, I've got this tour in Vietnam. I can stay in the States now. I, don't, I never have to come back. I said, okay, I'll stay in the military because it, with the CIA, I know I could go anywhere, you know. But I had a government commitment still, so I said, uh, I'll, stay with, <laughs> I'll stay with the Air Force. You guys can control my assignments. Little did I know that I'd, I'd spend more years back in that arena, uh, working later for a uh, company called uh, Air America. In the debriefing session, uh, if you can tell us this, uh, were you informed uh, of the fact that um, as to who put the orders out that sh none of you should return, none of you should be come back alive? He told me that it was Nixon who gave the order that no one can survive. And Bill said that when he got that order in, uh, Haig and Kissinger disagreed with it, but the orders came from the commander-in-chief himself. So he had to plan the contingency as such. He said, but I, you know, uh, Sergeant Tatum, I planned it so that uh, I knew you guys could overcome this obstacle. The two mountain men. That's right. But. And it, it, but the, we just didn't have a contingency for the rest of it, nothing you can do. When, when you have a United States Army colonel uh, and United States Air Force colonel, both uh, become traitors to their country. Where are these colonels today? I don't know. Okay. So that's much for that sa question. That's the, that's the safe <laughs> answer. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't put money on that one. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, so be it. Let's leave that uh, as is. Uh, you come back, you go to work for the Air Force uh, on a contingency plan to also work with the CIA, right? Operational control. All my orders at that point uh, would be controlled by the Central Intelligence Agency. They, they would work through... Uh, actually, the position that they used to work to, to gain movements as I would receive orders and see who signed the orders was a person who would provide, who would be seated at, as the... Um, uh, Deputy Director of Intelligence to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and most of the orders that I have, you'll see, I have, uh, so I don't, they may be in there, one of them may be in there. You'll see that this person is the person who will, would sign those orders through the years and actually move me from one place to another. Uh, at one point, that man's name was Colin Powell. Uh, so, what was, uh, Colin, what was Colin Powell's rank at that time? I think he was a two-star general at that time. That position was a two-star position. So, in essence, you actually went to work for the CIA, even yeah. though you were in the military status. Even though I was status. in the military. And pretty, pretty illegal, you know, you can't, we couldn't draw checks from two entities, double dip, uh, but uh, our operational efforts were all controlled by the CIA. 
And what were your assignments after that? You came back, you recovered, you, uh, you gained your health back. Uh, when you were uh, being uh, taken care of physically and uh, regaining your health, was Pop with you, your friend from Oklahoma? No, uh, he, he had been sent straight back to the States. His head wounds, uh, he received head wounds also. They were so severe that he had to go straight back to the tra trauma and care center. Uh, so that was uh, the end of your uh, relationship or association with Pop? Uh-huh, until later years, yeah. Until later years, okay. Right. You've been in touch with him since right. then, okay. Uh, but right now you're going to work, uh, you're still in the Air Force, you're going to work for the CIA. Okay. What were your assignments? One of the assignments, uh, to give you an example, I was mo moved all over the place. I was sent down uh, working. Because it was such a, an intense mission and there was a lot of knowledge on my part, the orders were they wanted to hold me close to the White House. So I was actually... Uh, Weren't they afraid you were going to talk? Well, that's what they wanted to ensure, you know. If, if they just gave me open movement, it's one thing, but they kept me very under very tight reins. Uh, I worked uh, at Key Biscayne at Homestead Air Force Base in the White House down there. Uh, I was in charge of the uh, receiver site for Air Force One when they would come in. Uh, in addition, was Nixon the president then? Nixon was the president then. Weren't you a little nervous over that? <laughs> as, as a matter of fact, <laughs> myself and my uh, uh, NCOIC uh, were going out to the control tower to bring in Air Force One at one point, and uh, uh, he had made a, a mention to the Secret Service as they were checking badges of personnel going in, saying, uh, he, he said, can I see, what are you doing in the area? And uh, my, the Master Sergeant said, oh, we're here to, here to see the crook. <laughs> <laughs> we found ourselves fa face down by the Secret Service, and then when they got our credentials, they said, what are you guys doing talking like that? So. <laughs> <laughs> Little did they know, huh? Well, he was just joking, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Little did they know that, Nixon, later had, on, that uh, yeah, uh, Nixon had given the order that you were not to return from an assignment uh, and in And I never Campbell. told him that, you know. Right. I had never told my NCOIC. I, I, I kept my lips closed and zipped for, for all 25 years. And in 1996, uh, that was the end of the 25-year classification period. And I, had start, I started my book then. Uh, but before we go up to 1996, uh, Chip, um, you had some assignments involving drugs mm -hmm. and uh, drug running by the CIA, right? Well, and yeah. Uh, in You're not reluctant to talk about that, are you? No, in two different arenas. In, South Viet or in, in the Vietnamese uh, conflict, uh, there was some involvement simply because the Air America pilots, you know, sometimes would carry drugs, sometimes they'd carry wheat, sometimes they'd carry rice, sometimes they'd carry weapons, you know. It was various... Uh, cargoes that they'd carry. And my job when an aircraft went down, primarily because they were carrying crypto gear, communications gear that uh, was uh, secret uh, and had codes on it that uh, couldn't be uh, gotten by the enemy, uh, I would have to jump in. I'd retrieve this crypto gear and many times retrieve the precious cargoes that was on board, heroin sometimes. Uh, and see that it was uh, extracted. Air America being a CIA uh, air operation. CIA air operation. Yeah. So you, you had that in Vietnam and then you came back and you went to work, uh, you were involved in... Uh... Actually, actually when Nixon went to Peking I was involved in that. Okay, in tell us about that. I was sent ahead of him into a place called Guam. I, I controlled the aircraft across and then I was moved over closer. And I what, what year are we now? That was I think 72. Okay. Maybe seventy-two. So um, you were you were uh, you went to Guam. You were to control, control the air traffic. Controlled, con controlled the Air Force One across, and then we we were also the primary one of the primary communication stations. I was moved to a place that we use today even as a primary commo spot, and I can't give that place away, but it's very close to China to the Chinese border. Uh, then we were moved there to maintain contact in case there was an emergency, so we could put fighters in. And. Uh, but uh, that was it. I mean, basically, you were just guiding the plane. I mean, la keeping the lanes open so no other aircraft would be in that air, air, air lane, right? We'd keep aircraft 25 miles from Air Force One. We'd have two fighter aircraft in, for in front of Air Force One, two, air two fighters to the rear, and have rescue aircraft up in different uh, locations along the way. And, uh, okay, nothing unusual about him going to Peking, though, was there? No, nothing at all. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Other than he's the first president, uh, you know, to go to China, right? And and now and going along him with him, with open access was Dr. Kissinger. So, right. Uh, okay, let's go back to uh, your CIA uh, activity 
in South America, Central America? Uh, in 1978, I actually left service uh, of the government. That uh, Bill Colby had, uh, being my handler, had moved on uh, in the early 70s to Washington to take a position, and ultimately became the director of the CIA. He maintained because of the uh, sensitivity of what I knew from that mission. Uh, he maintained uh, direct control over me, uh, and when he passed the baton on to uh, the new director of the CIA, that new director called me back out of the field. I was in Yugoslavia at the time. Uh, to Colby uh, debriefed me, and uh, Mr. Bush rebriefed me, uh, and he was explained at, during the briefing and debriefing that uh, I was loyal, I was, I was a good man, and anything he needed, I was a trusted entity, and he could count on me. I had no problems with that. Uh, yeah, Bush uh, uh, was uh, head of the CIA at that time, and he personally debriefed you? He personally inbriefed me as his personal asset. Inbriefed me, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. As one of his personal assets. Right. So that, that was my first contact with the, the man who would someday become president. Uh, Bill had become a good friend, Colby, through the years, and uh, worked with me, trained me taught me the ropes and uh, he told me he said chip you know you do have some en enemies in Washington uh, you know you know that uh, Haig and Kissinger are very powerful men uh, Nixon's a very powerful man you, you need to be sure that uh, maybe you need to leave government service I, you don't have me up here to protect you any longer so I did in 78 I left we, I relocated to Colorado started my family got married relocated to Colorado uh, started a little sandwich shop and I was in the sandwich shop one day and in walked uh, these two guys with sunglasses and suits again. <laughs> God, those suits. <laughs> okay, uh, you're you're jumping ahead now. I want to go back out to Central South America. Are you avoiding that or? No, we haven't gotten to that. that oh, you haven't. About, oh, really? That was in 1980 when I was reactivated. Oh, in 1980 you reactivated. Okay, right. so you go to Colorado and all of a sudden two guys with suits walk in with sunglasses, and uh, what do they say to you? They say bulldog, and I just thought, oh no, <laughs> and I didn't answer. Then they said. Uh, Pegasus, and that was the code name that I was given. So I knew, you know, I, I didn't know who they were at first, but when they used Pegasus, I knew I was toast. I was right. Toast. Pegasus was a code word used for, for your me. operation. Right. You personally. For my, that was my code name. Okay. So I was, uh, I was told that I, my new assignment was to go to a place called Fort Campbell, Kentucky. But you were out of the service then. Um, as a reserve officer, you're never really. You no, know, uh, you're in the reserve. In the reserves, right? Okay. Uh, so, uh, I, I was reactivated. I was sent to a place called Fort Campbell, Kentucky. They decided uh, after the uh, problem in the desert, trying to get the hostages held in Iran, uh, where our aircraft all went into one another, um, that they needed a task force set up for anti-terrorism. So they decided they'd they'd, per, they'd put together an aviation task force at Fort, at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. They took CIA, CIA assets, CIA officers, uh, they put them under the control of the National Security Council, and uh, they built this new unit called uh, 160th Aviation Company that really wasn't on any of the uh, military uh, TO&E equipment lists. So there we were. Another covert operation. Another covert operation build, building itself in uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Uh, during, dur during the time uh, from 80, 1980 through 1984 uh, uh, that we were building that unit, uh, testing different techniques of flight, testing different uh, flight platforms, a lot of them I can't talk about. Uh, we we uh, would get into some heavy losses because we were doing things that never were done with these helicopters and other aircraft that we were flying. Um, and so on one particular occasion we lost a, uh, we lost a one of our unit commanders, a major, flew into some, to some high power lines during a night, nighttime exercise. Uh, he was killed. His co-pilot, a warrant officer, had his legs cut off. Uh, during the crash, post-crash investigation, a man from Washington came in and he identified himself as Jake. He was accompanied by another man who wouldn't identify himself, and so we just nicknamed him the Snake. Jake it, the Snake. Jake and the Snake. That's that's who was there. He was a pretty slimy guy, you know. Uh, we would later find that uh, Jake was a person who was attached to the NSC, and his uh, actual name was Oliver North. And that's your first contact with Ollie North? That was my first contact with Ollie North. And um, so what happened after that? Um, we had, uh, saying we, the, the United States government had uh, pushed for a little rebellion down in Central America. 
a place called Nicaragua. They had uh, pushed and helped organize a group of rebels called the Contras. Uh, they talked them into uh, fighting against the Sandinistas. I don't know why. I have, I have some ideas uh, why, but I won't get into just my ideas because I don't know why, other than someone thinking that it's a terrible thing that a country have its own sovereignty and not do like we are. Uh, have this not be ruled by the CIA. <laughs> right. <laughs> at, at any rate, the, uh, the CIA uh, helped, promised that they would fund and they would back this uh, rebellion, uh, but a, a man named Boland came out with, a, with an act in Congress that uh, after we had set this thing up and it started, the war was uh, in, in full swing down there, didn't allow us to support them any longer, except in a humanitarian effort. So the next thing I knew, uh, I guess because of my contact with the then, then Vice President of the United States, uh, who uh, actually oversaw uh, by National Security De Decision Directive Number 2, actually saw oversaw all intelligence operations. George Bush. George Bush, uh, having been personally handled by him and him knowing that I was reactivated and working in this uh, special operations unit in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, they said that we want you to go down posing as a humanitarian down there. And in the briefing with North, I said, what do you mean as a humanitarian? He said, you're going to be a medevac pilot now. You're going to fly medical aircraft into these contra camps. Uh, that's humanitarian. It's allowed. And uh, you'll, you'll serve, uh, in the briefing, he said, you'll serve three entities. You'll serve the United States Army as a medevac pilot. You'll serve the United States Embassy uh, through, the, through the military office. Uh, and, and you will serve, uh, and that was CIA, that portion. And you'll you serve the Pegasus operations, that we'll call it, because of your code name. And Pegasus operations are directly controlled by the NSC. Now, was this uh, North gave you this briefing in Colorado when you walked into your shop, or was this later? No, this was much later. This, this briefing was, act, was actually done in uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Then the next thing I knew, I you know, I North, had, North gave you the briefing there, right? I had so North walks into your shop in Colorado, says, "Hey, come on." No, uh, no. two two agents walked. Oh, into it wasn't shop North. In Colorado. I thought no. Jake was North. No, no, no. Okay. Well, Jake was, but Jake and the snake came to the crash investigation, uh, where my commander had got, gotten killed. I see. Okay, at okay. Fort Campbell, right. So the the people that walked into Colorado, that that was not they North. They were just a couple agents couple coming of, in to let me know I'm going back to work. Okay. All right. And, uh, and then you were uh, briefed by uh, were, Ollie? I found that they were actually NSA. Okay. So, yeah. You want to explain what NSA is? National Security Agency. They do a lot of the background checks and everything in the United States. A lot, a lot of the spooks who listen to everything that's said here is NSA. Right. The communications mainly is their job. Uh -huh. Like wiretaps and uh, keeping track of all of us uh, via the telephones. And uh -huh. that's their job. So uh, you're in Fort Campbell, you're uh, giving this assignment, you're going to be flying in and out medical supplies, right? Mm -hmm. And where are you flying these medical supplies out of? Out of the Contra camps. Uh, when I finally went down posing as a medevac pilot, we, would, uh, we went into the Contra camps. We'd always take coolers in. Uh, usually the coolers going in were C4 explosives, grenades, things like that. Uh, and we would bring medical supplies out, uh, and those medical supplies we would bring out in these coolers. Uh, big 120, 124 quart coolers uh, were act, was actually packages, you know, bricks of cocaine. Okay. Did you actually see this? Actually saw it. Actually tested it. And where did you do this? We did field tests right in our uh, medevac uh, offices in uh, Pomerola Air Base. So uh, before you put it on the plane, you tested it, make sure it was real cocaine? No. We, we tested them uh, on several occasions. We didn't test every package, but some occasions they were delivered to our, our uh, operations headquarters at Pomerola to take to an to a aircraft at a different location to fly out of the country. Uh, and whenever that happened, I, I would actually do a field test on it right there. On occasion, when I could get away with it without anyone seeing me, I'd do a field test on the aircraft. That was pretty hard to do. Uh, Chip, you're flying out of what airfield field in the United States? Um, in Honduras, we were fly, flying out of the Contra camps into three airfields. In, one was San Lorenzo, one was Pomerola, and the other was in, in the northern part of the country called La Mesa. Uh, from there, the, the uh, coolers were picked up by C-130s, uh, C-141s, or, or one, civilian 123s. Uh, C-123s run by a, a company called uh, 